Okay, this is exciting. Uh, we're, we're going through our series in the Gospel of Luke, but we've come to a place where we see Jesus doing something very unique. And, and it takes us all the way back to the beginning. Like it takes us into the book of Genesis and, and we start dealing with Noah's kids. And, and, and so there's just a lot of stuff happening here. So I'm excited about today. There's a lot to unpack. You may need to check this message out more than one time to gain everything that's in it. So much so that I actually debated making it a two-part uh, message. But for our purposes, we're gonna do it in one. Luke chapter 10, verse one to 24. And uh, we're just gonna dive right in. So Luke chapter 10, one to 24. If you're not sure where the Gospel of Luke is, you've heard me say this a dozen times. Um, just look at your table of contents. And by doing so, you're gonna be able to figure out where things are and you won't feel any kind of insecurity uh, in doing so because it's there for a reason. So Luke chapter 10, one to 24. I'm gonna read just verses one and two because in verses one and two, we have kind of the crux of what Jesus is getting at. And the rest of it is sort of an explanation of how do we then do these things and, and, and purposes behind these things and, and some lessons that we can learn about what it means to faithfully serve Jesus and do ministry in his name. So when you have it, Luke chapter 10, verse one and two, here's what it says. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places he planned to visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into his field. Let's pray together. Lord God, I thank you so much for today. And I thank you that we have your word to dive into. I thank you, Lord, that you show us things that tie your entire story of your uh, working with us to draw us back to you. Uh, all through your text, Lord, and, we're, and, and so we're excited about this. Lord, I pray that you will help us to be a people who have eyes that see and ears that hear and hearts that are open to you today. In your name I pray. Amen. So I, I mentioned to you that there's a lot going on here. And, and so I think it's really important that, that we start looking at some questions that may come up out of the text. Now, immediately, for me, growing up after, after I accepted Christ, I read in the Bible and, and I read about these 12 disciples that get sent out. And that kind of makes sense to me, right? Like there's the 12 of them, they're hanging with Jesus for these years and, and he's discipling them and he's growing them to take over his ministry, preparing them for when he's gone. But I never understood this part where he sent out the 72. Like why 72? What was the significance of that number? Uh, and, and, and I didn't really understand it until I started um, in college and, and looking more into the depth of how the New Testament and the Old Testament connect to each other and, and how Jesus is fulfilling some of the things that took place in the Old Testament and even overturning some of the things and reorienting them back in the right direction. And we're kind of facing that here with this. It says, like, again, we'll read verse one. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them out two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. Now, this is coming right after Jesus is talking to his disciples about what it means to, to follow him, right? Like to count the cost to follow him. And, and there's a lot of stuff that goes into that. If you missed last week's message, I encourage you to go check that out um, and, and to evaluate what it means for you to be a person who follows Jesus and counts the costs of what it means to follow him. In this one, we hear so many different things in, in terms of what it means to faithfully minister in his name, to, to, to do ministry in Jesus' name. But it starts with some context. And so you could say, and it's understood, that while sending out the 12 earlier in chapter 9, sending out the 12 disciples uh, into the different towns, Jesus is sending them to the nation of Israel, right? Like it's representative of the people of God, the nation of Israel. But in the sending out of the 72, it's representative of the rest of the nations of the world. Now you may ask, okay, well, Rob, what's the deal with the rest of the nations of the world? Like where do we get that from? And how do we get the number 72? Well, we have this thing uh, in the book of Genesis, actually. It's called the table of nations. And the table of nations is, is all the descendants of the sons of Noah. And, and it kind of, it, it reads like this. 
Well, actually, uh, what we learn in, in Genesis chapter 10 is that there are 14 descendants of his son Japheth, there are 30 descendants of his son Ham, and 26 descendants of his son Shem. And this is a Jewish tradition of understanding that, and, and again, depending on whether or not you're, uh, like what translation you're using, is either 72 or 70 nations that derive from uh, Noah's sons, and it's based on the count in this table. Now, the, the actual sum, right, it is not like listed in an actual chart table, that kind of thing. But what people have done is they've taken and, and counted how many of these descendants there were and understood then from that point, like from these descendants came all the other nations of the world. And so it, the interesting thing is that within this, we find that God actually decides that he's going to keep a nation unto himself. And so then there's God's nation, and then there's these other nations, and these other nations are the nations of the world. And they're represented by the number, again, depending on your translation, 70 or 72, and this, as is the case in the Gospel of Luke, that some translations might say 70, some say 72, and that's dependent on which manuscripts you're using. It's not really a discrepancy because it doesn't change anything in terms of the meaning. Um, and, and so it's really important that we understand that. And again, to dive further into that, uh, we won't have time together to do that today, but I encourage you to look into it further so that you can gain some satisfaction and understanding of the significance there. But we we'll also find here that, that there's something interesting taking place here. Like there's, there's these... 70, 72 nations, and they kind of are a bit of an undercurrent to other passages of Scripture where God is talking about the nations of the world. For example, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 8, uh, this idea that there are these, these 70 or 72 nations that God divides people into um, is, is, again, it's understood that from the Jewish historians as well as those who are scholars in the scripture that is referencing this idea of 70 to 72. Here's what I mean. Deuteronomy 32, verse 8. The Most High gave the nations their inheritance when he divided all mankind, set boundaries for the people according to the numbers of the sons of Israel. So this is the idea of, of God dividing the peoples. He's putting up some borders. This is the indication that there's nations, and it's according to the number of the sons of Israel. Now, here's where it gets weird, because you have... Some translations, some um, of our manuscripts that are going to indicate the term sons of Israel. But you have other ones that are vastly older that use a different phrase. And if this other phrase is true, it just creates all kinds of nuances that get pretty exciting. Because it dives into some of the weird stuff that a lot of us like looking at in the Bible. So there's this thing called the Septuagint. The Septuagint is a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. Now, the reason that that's important to, to know the Septuagint is because the Septuagint is actually one of the oldest documents we have, um, and, and it gives us a lot of insight, and it gives us a, a strong ability to be able to fully understand or better understand what the original text is. In addition to that, we have this thing called the Dead Sea Scrolls. And the Dead Sea Scrolls um, are older than uh, what's called the Masoretic Text. The Masoretic Text is, is uh, where you have uh, Jewish rabbis, they come together, they're going on memory on what they remembered the Old Testament to be saying, and so they write these things down. It's accurate, it's good, um, but what we have here is we have in the Dead Sea Scrolls and in the Septuagint, it actually uses the language sons of God. So according to the number of the sons of God rather than the sons of Israel. Now, you may say, okay, Rob, isn't that a discrepancy? And I would suggest to you that it's not so much that it's a discrepancy in that um, there are sometimes, there are scribal, what they call variations, that, that cause us to have to do further study in the text because we are dealing with an ancient document that has multiple, like thousands upon thousands of manuscripts. And so it's important for us to try to stick as close to those things as we can. And we use the oldest known manuscripts that have the highest level of consistency in order to be able to get our understanding of the fullness of what it means to have our Bible. And so if it is true that the translation, no, actually, I've got a quote here for you that, that I think will be helpful to this. So, 
The Septuagint and the Dead Sea Scrolls, this Deuteronomy fragment reads the sons of God instead of the sons of Israel, and it reflects the notion that dates all the way back to the book of Daniel, chapter uh, 10, verse 20, and maybe even earlier in Psalm 82, verse 7, that every nation had a divine patron. So that's the quote, and here's what they mean. When the nations were divided, there is this belief in ancient Judaism that every single nation had a deity that was sort of responsible for that nation. And, and so it would be like, you have God, God Almighty, He's the creator of all things, and, and God being a God of order, He creates this hierarchy of angelic beings. And within that hierarchy, we know from the text that we have, for example, archangels. We know that we have seraphim and cherubim, and they all have sort of different roles. Now, specifically, as it relates to the nations, there was this ancient belief that every nation had an angel that was sort of responsible for that particular nation. Now, what seems to be the case in, in the Bible, as some scholars want to indicate, is that there was this falling away by these angels that then caused them to become deities of worship. It became, became angels that were worshipped by the people, and, and, and so then this is where we get, for example, in the book of Daniel, that um, the angel uh, Gabriel wanted to come to Daniel, but he was held back by the prince of Persia. That's an interesting statement, the prince of Persia. And then the, it, within the same text, it indicates that after the angel leaves, that the prince of Greece is going to come. And so there is this language of these territorial, these geographical hierarchy of angelic beings that have some measure of responsibility. And, and, and so that brings us into this fascinating space of trying to figure out what this unseen um, world really looks like and, and how, it, how it plays out. So here's the thing. If it is true that the best translation, the most widest or the most widely recognized and asserted translation of this is sons of God, then we have certain resulting actions from Jesus that will restore God's order. Here's what I mean. In the sending out of the 12 and in the sending out of the 72, you have this call back to one God, right? Because if, 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 if there are these champion, these patron deities that are over all these nations, and they, they begin to get worshipped instead of God being worshipped, then there's a call back to the worshipping of the one true God. So that's one thing that's taking place. Jesus sends out his disciples both to Israel and to the Gentiles to call them back into worshipping the one true God. That's something that takes place. So it's an undoing of something that happened all the way back in Genesis and certainly within Deuteronomy. You also then have a comeback to one people. In the sending out of the 72, it seeks to collect the people back under this understanding of we're one people under one God. You got to remember that in Deuteronomy, they were dispersed and there were boundaries and there were borders that were set up. And what we find here now is that when he's sending out the 72, he's drawing it all back together. Like it's all coming. He's undoing all the stuff that happened. And, and recognize that when Jesus is talking about his kingdom, he's establishing this kingdom and he's undoing all the things that happened in the Old Testament that, guys, this is just incredible stuff when you see the links coming together. And then, interestingly enough, right? Because at the Tower of Babel, the Tower of Babel is when you ultimately see the peoples dispersed and they're dispersed on the basis of language. And so they were one people under one God. They... Uh, we're having one language, and, and at Babel, you see it dispersed. You see that there's these patron deities that are over all the different nations that ultimately end up getting worshipped at some point. And, and so then you have people, Jesus sending the disciples out to bring them back to one God. He's bringing them back into being one people. And then, check this out, at Pentecost, he brings them back into one language. Like, the languages were confused at Babel, and they're brought back together at Pentecost because everyone heard like, here, here's what it says. Acts chapter 2, verse 5 and 6. Now that we're staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from, listen, every nation under heaven. What is every nation under heaven? 70 or 72 of the other nations of the world. When they heard this sound, talking about the disciples speaking, sorry, and the, and the, and the wind coming and the, and the crashing of thunder and stuff, uh, as the tongues of fire were coming upon the 
disciples. When they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. They heard their own language. They were all drawn together. They heard their own language being spoken. And so the language all came back together. This is incredible. So what Jesus is doing is that he's returning things back to where they need to be. Come back to one God. Come back to one people. Come back to one language. It's, a, it's the great undoing. It is amazing. And then he carries on. In verse 2, he says, He told them the harvest is plentiful, uh, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send workers into the harvest field. And then he says, Go, I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. Do not take any purse or bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. And what we find here is that Jesus is then saying, Okay, look, I'm going to send you out. This is kind of what's taking place in the sending of you up because I'm drawing all the people back together. And in doing so, here's kind of your marching orders on how to function within this ministry that I'm sending you into. And he starts off by saying, like instructing them that they need to be a people of prayer. Look, the reality is, is that they were going into a scenario where there were more people needing to hear the gospel than there were people being able to spread the gospel. And I don't know that we're really that different today. Like, there's so much work of ministry that needs to get done, uh, so much so that there's, there's this axiom that people try to, you know, claim that 20% of the people do 80% of the work. And, and so if you take that to be a truth, then you're going to say, okay, Lord, we need more workers for the harvest, right? Like, and so pray to the Lord of harvest to raise up more workers for it. And so we need to be a people who are praying for the harvest, but also that the Lord would send more people to help do the work of the ministry to bring in the harvest. So that's one thing he says. So you gotta be people who pray. You gotta pray for more people, more laborers to help with the harvest. In addition to that, hey, here are the circumstances I'm sending, into you, sending you into. I'm sending you as lambs among wolves. And, and, and Matthew talks about the idea of, he adds to it, and he says, um, be as shrewd as serpents and innocent as doves, right? So I'm sending you as lambs, lambs among wolves, be as shrewd as serpents, innocent, as doves, and it's this idea that, look, you're going into a world that's just hostile. You're going into a world that every conceivable thing about that world wants to eat you up, right? Like that's what wolves do with lambs. They eat them, they're food. Like this is how it plays out. And so it's a dangerous thing for lambs to be sent out among wolves. And Jesus is saying, look, this is the contest I'm sending you into. You're gonna be people who are gonna be praying about more workers coming into the harvest, but in this harvest time, in this world I'm sending you into, you're going as lambs among wolves. So. Christian, think about this. Stop thinking about the world as if it's not a wolf. They're not just distant lambs. They're wolves. That's the world we're being sent into. And in that context, he's saying, be brave. The world is hostile. Be brave. Be bold. Go. Not you be hostile. There's no indication in the scriptures in any way, shape, or form that we as believers going into the harvest field, going into this hostile environment where we're going out to the wolves, that we are to be hostile. But we are to be shrewd as serpents, cunning. We're to be wise. We're to be stewards of our time and our energies and our finances and our, and our mechanisms, our methodologies. And so we should be shrewd and creative, but innocent. In other words, we will not sin in our actions towards the world. We're not going to do things that Jesus didn't do. We're not going to be a people who are hostile to the world. We're going to be a people who bring the message of freedom and salvation to the world. That's what we do. And then he says, take nothing with you. And the indication there is that in everything that you're doing, you need to be fully dependent on God. Look, it's easy for us to come up with all our plans and our strategies, and if we just get the right amount of finances, we can get everything we need to be able to do this ministry. But in doing so, there's a critical piece of doing ministry that we neglect, and that is that we need to be fully dependent on God. And so he's getting these disciples to recognize their need to be fully dependent on God. That's, that's a principle of doing ministry when we were sent people who were praying for more workers, when we were sent people as lambs among wolves, when we were sent people who were to be dependent on the one who sent us. And that dependency looks wildly different depending on where you're going. It's not necessarily that we're all called to just 
take nothing with us and that kind of thing. And this is a specific thing that was taking place. But the principle that Jesus is suggesting or demanding of his disciples, you got to depend on me. So here's the question. Do we pray for more laborers for the harvest? And not selfishly. Not so that we can have help in getting work done. Do we pray to the Lord of the harvest to send laborers into the harvest so that the harvest is taking place for the sake of lost souls? Do we recognize that we're lambs among wolves and that we need to be shrewd and innocent, that we need to be bold, not hostile, that we need to pursue people with the message of freedom and, and salvation rather than behavior modification? And do we depend on Jesus for these things? This is the context that he's setting up for us to understand what's about to take place. This is this, literally, it's a great undoing of ministry that we're being sent into. And so he carries on and he talks about this idea of entering a house, right? So he says, when you enter a house, first say, right? So this is your, your first thing that you do. First say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, or a man of peace might be another way to say it, your peace will rest on them. If not, in other words, if there isn't a person who is peaceful there, then it'll return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking, whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. Now, verse 5 and 7 sound a bit foreign to our ears, right? Because this is not how we tend to do things. This is not how we greet people. But the disciples are instructed upon entering house to say peace to this house, and and in saying peace to this house, these words will rest upon the son of peace or the one who promotes peace, who seeks peace, but not upon the one who rejects the message, right? So the one who receives it, who is a person of peace, they're going to receive it. The one who is not will reject it. Now, the Greek word for peace here is a translation from the Hebrew word shalom. Now, the shalom means peace, but there's, there's layers to it and there's greater depths of meaning to, to it. Uh, it has a wide meaning, but the root of the idea is well-being. And, and well-being can carry the concept of bodily health. It can carry the concept of um, financial, relational health, it, it, you know, friends, relationships, that kind of stuff. But it also carries a very strong religious use. Shalom is the gift of Yahweh. It's the gift of God. So the world... So the word moves into the concept of the gift of God's salvation and wholeness in this context. So shalom is a word that pronounces a blessing of salvation. Like Isaiah 57, 18 to 19 says this. I've seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners of Israel. Peace. Peace to those far and near, says the Lord and I will heal them. So this is significant. This is the idea that God is going to proclaim peace and he's going to offer salvation. Now, again, we, we, we have this uh, iterated in the scriptures numerous times. One of the other times, which I think is really significant, it's called an Aaronic benediction. It's a classic bestowing of shalom upon God's people. It's taken from the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 6, verse 23 to 27 Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. So this is God speaking to Moses. Say to them, so here's what he's to say to the Israelites in order to bless them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And then listen. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Now I want you to notice that Aaron and his sons are, speak, are to speak a blessing of peace, after which God brings the actual peace of salvation that follows. And it's close to the uses of what we find in our passage. It says, when you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him, and if not, it will return to you. Now, the phrase man of peace in the NIV literally means son of peace, and it's this common Hebrew idiom uh, son of, that can mean two things. It's a person who shares in the quality of something, or it's a person who's worthy of the quality 
of something. And so in this sense, we're talking about peace. It's a person who shares in the peace, or it's a person who is deserving of this peace. And so our passage can mean either a peaceful person or a person worthy or destined for peace. And these two concepts blend together. Um, they blend together. They, they blend into each other. And we see the idea, though, of worthy of or destined for in the phrase later on in Luke chapter 20, sons of the resurrection. And that is that those who are worthy of the resurrection, those who are destined for the resurrection. And so the son of peace in our passage probably means a person worthy of peace, destined for peace. And this person who receives the word of the kingdom and therefore the salvation that comes by believing in this word, right? Like that's what happens. It's a person who receives the word and, and then it fully experiences that word because they believe in that word. That's interesting, right? So you go into these towns. So you go to the town, and, and in, in the indication there is that, uh, sorry, that you go into the homes, and the indication there is that, um, though later we see that there's going to be this accountability to the entire community, it, it doesn't mean that even if one person within that community does receive peace, that they're suddenly not going to be experiencing that peace, right, like from God. So it says when you enter a town. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat whatever is offered to you, heal the sick who are there, and tell them the kingdom of God has come near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcomed, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. So not as a hostility to you, not as I don't want anything to do with you, but as a warning to you because this action that we take here is indicative of the idea that you are not of God. Like you're under his judgment. You're going to be under discipline. And he says, yet be sure of this. The kingdom of God has come near. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day for Sodom than for that town. Now, when he talks about that day, he's talking about judgment day, he's talking about the day where Jesus comes back and he judges all the nations and, um, and, and, and the peoples of those nations. And so he's saying here, look, it's going to be more bearable for Sodom than for that town. Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the miracles that were performed in you had been performed in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. But it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the day of, at the judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, you were lifted to the heavens. Well, sorry, will you be lifted to the heavens? No, you will go down into Hades. So it, it, this, this passage is an interesting one because it begs some questions. Like, what, what happened in these places that, that is causing this, this warning, this woe to them? Well, Bethsaida is the site of many miracles. This is where Jesus walked on water in the Sea of Galilee. This is Mark chapter 6, verses 45 to 51. There's a healing of the blind man in Mark chapter 8, verse 22 to 26. There's the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke chapter 9, verse 12 to 17. And so these are the things that Bethsaida experienced. And what Jesus is saying here, look, if Bethsaida, like if these other guys had seen this, they would have repented. They would have been in sackcloth and ashes, which is the outfit of repentance. It's like my, it is this denotation of I'm going to remove all my earthly goods, including my earthly clothing, and just put on sackcloth and, and ashes. And these are all representative of a repentant heart. And, and so that's what they would have done, this tire in Sidon. And they experienced what you experienced, Bethsaida. And Chorazin, uh, like he worked miracles in Chorazin. We know that it's multiple miracles because it's a plural statement here. But we just don't know like which miracles that were performed there. And we don't actually even know how many miracles were performed there. And so what we do know is that Jesus performed miracles there and he's holding them to account for what they witnessed and then ultimately didn't receive. Like they rejected the message of the gospel in Chorazin. An indicator of, of knowledge that we don't have, but recognition that there were more things that Jesus did would be John 21, 25. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room in the books that would be written. And so it's this idea that, hey, Jesus did a whole lot of stuff. Here are the things that we're recording for you that give you everything you need, um, maybe not everything you want. But the cities that these Galilean towns are compared to are notorious examples of heathen cities known for their sinfulness. 
Sodom, of course, is destroyed along with Gomorrah. And as a matter of fact, only very recently did they find, did archaeologists actually find Sodom and Gomorrah? And this is one of those things that's blowing archaeological world up. Like people are talking about this in such an incredible find. But I want to let you know that it substantiates the Bible. Like it shows all the more that the Bible actually can be trusted with the things that are in it. When Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed uh, by fire and brimstone, when God delivered Lot and his family before bringing judgment on them, this is, again, Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 to 19. God says to Abraham in verse 18, verse 20, chapter 18, verse 20, the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sins so grievous. Like, there weren't even 10 righteous men in the entire city. And so if, if God had not brought destruction of judgment to those cities, he wouldn't have been just. He wouldn't have been just. Tyre and Sidon, two originally Phoenician cities that are along the coast of Lebanon. So it's on the, on the uh, western coast of Israel. And, and uh, these were just north of Galilee, and they represent the heathen world. And Tyre especially is regarded as a subject of divine judgment in the book of Amos, in the book of Isaiah, in the book of Jeremiah, and even in Ezekiel. And so Tyre was quite representative as being hostile towards God and rebellious towards God. It's a sinful nation. nation. And Capernaum is mentioned here as well. And this is where Jesus did a huge amount of his ministry. He's actually just leaving his ministry from Capernaum and fixing his eyes on Jerusalem. And even there, didn't turn wholeheartedly to Jesus' teaching when he performed miracles there. And Jesus says that the godless cities of Tyre and Sidon would have indeed repented fully, sitting in sackcloth and ashes. And again, these are signs of voluntary humbling and repentance among the Jews. And so consider what happened even at Nineveh when this reluctant prophet by the name of Jonah goes to Nineveh and preaches there. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 5, it says, The Ninevites believed God, they declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And this is, again, this idea of, of representation of their repentance. And then Jesus says, Whoever listens to me, I'm sorry, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you rejects me. But whoever rejects me rejects the one who sent me. And then they go. Now, here's what's critically important. What that tells us is that it isn't about us. Our responsibility is to go and proclaim the message. And when we go and proclaim the message, if people listen to us, they listen to Jesus. If they don't listen to us, they're not listening to Jesus. But either way, it points back to Jesus. And if they're listening... And if they're, re if they're either listening or if they're rejecting on either of these things, what they're ultimately doing is either listening to God or rejecting God. But it's not about us. And I think so often our own insecurities and our own fears just make it about us. I'm not going to share the gospel because I don't want to be made to feel uncomfortable. Well, but it's not about you. And if they reject you, they're rejecting Jesus. And guess what? You're in good company. And he sends them out helping them to recognize that the focus of the message is Jesus and the one who sent him, not us. And then, after they go out, we don't know how long they're out there, they come back, and it says the 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. And he replied, like, think about it, even the demons listen to us in your name, and this is Jesus' reply. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the Spirit submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And so Jesus begins by cautioning them on the danger of becoming proud. Like, I want you to notice that, that their stated cause or, or case for being filled with joy and excitement was that the demons obey them. That I just need to let you know, is, is not a mature faith. Well, of course the demons obey. Why? Well, because you're going in the name of Jesus, and you're centered on Jesus, and you're fixed on Jesus. And it seems that from what we've seen in Jesus' ministry of healing people, that 
part of healing people is casting demons from them because there's a spiritual healing in these safe places. And sometimes, according to the scriptures, that people are experiencing physical ailments as a result of demons. And so, yeah, of course, that's going to come along. He sends you out to heal people. Of course, you're going to cast out demons. It's a necessary part of healing some people. But then he warns them, essentially, not to be like Satan. He says that he saw Satan fall from heaven, which came about quite queerly. Like if either Isaiah 14, 12 to 14 or Ezekiel 28, 11 to, uh, 11 to 17 is alluding to Satan, then the fall of Satan was due to his pride. Well, what is he challenging them on? Pride. So beware of pride because it easily arises and God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble according to 1 Peter 5, 5. And then he points out that their ability to do these miraculous things while performing their ministry came directly from the authority that they received from Jesus. So it wasn't, again, it's not about them. It's not about anything they bring to the table. It's all about the fact that they are resourced by Jesus. The power they had came from and was dependent on Jesus. It wasn't about them. In the same way, it's not about us. Whatever ministries we have, is dependent on Jesus. Jesus makes sure that they understand that as amazing as it was that the spirits had to obey them, the real cause for rejoicing was not this temporal thing that was taking place. It was not this, uh, this earthly thing that was taking place that demons would obey them. The, the thing that they should actually rejoice about is this thing that's eternal. So here's a principle, this is important. Do not lose sight of the eternal by getting fixated in what is temporal. Do not lose sight of the eternal by getting fixated on what is temporal. It doesn't matter that the demons obey you. What matters is that your name is written in the book of life. Fixate on that. Take joy in that. And the same principles apply to any ministry that you or I may have. Our spiritual gift, our ministry, the power that comes with it is all from God. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 4 to 11, right? Like it all comes from God. Paul points out in 1 Corinthians 1, 16 to 31, that we have no reason to boast except in God's grace. Paul did a lot of really cool things. And you can be happy about what God enables you to do. And I hope that you and I will marvel at the things of God. That he's working his, his mission out and bringing glory to his name. But the true cause of rejoicing is being saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And right after Jesus tells them that, hey, this is what you actually need to rejoice in, Jesus himself begins to rejoice. In verse 21 and 22, at that time, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, Je sorry, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those whom the Son chose to reveal him. And so it's clear in this text that these were ordinary men, perhaps some would suggest just ignorant fishermen, and he calls them infants compared to the wise and the intelligent, to whom God revealed extraordinary things, not the wise and intelligent, but to these unlearned men. You would be wise to rejoice over the same things that Jesus does. Pay attention to notice what God is doing and then praise him for it. Be careful of being so caught up in the things of daily life that, that, our earthly, that we become earthly minded and, and have no heavenly good. By the way, what an incredible strategy. If you really want to limit the efficacy or the effectiveness of the Christian life, then get them focused on this world rather than on eternity. If I'm focused on eternity, then I'll have a sense of urgency uh, for proclaiming the good news and for living out the Christian walk. But if I'm focused on this life, then I become the focus. And it's all about me, and it's all about what I get. And it doesn't sound much like what Jesus calls us into, into this life of service and sacrifice. I want you to notice the interaction of the Trinity in verse 21. God the Son, Jesus, rejoices greatly through God, the Holy Spirit, over what God the Father is doing. In verse 22, is, a very, is very strong on the deity of Jesus. The Father has handed all authority to Jesus, including knowledge of himself. And if you want to know God the Father, then God the Son will have to reveal him to you. 
this is another scriptural passage that those who deny the Trinity or the deity of Jesus must either ignore or twist. And then there's this blessing that Jesus talks about. The blessing of the revelation of the gospel, verses 23 to 24 uh, Jesus points out that there's a great blessing that these disciples had and had received. Um, and uh, the one that I will tell you that we've received as well, he says, then he turned to his disciples and said privately, blessed are those who see what you see. For I tell you, many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but didn't see it and wanted to hear what you hear, but didn't hear it. Like Peter explains this blessing to which Jesus is referring to in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10 to 12. He says, concerning this salvation, listen, the prophets who spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and the circumstances which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when they predicted the sufferings of the Messiah and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves, but you. When they spoke of the things that have now been told to you by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, even the angels longed or look into these things, longed to look into these things. So what had been promised from old was now happening before their very eyes. We who live now can look back on the multiple prophecies concerning Jesus, his ministry, his salvation that he brought to mankind through his atoning sacrificial work on the cross. So what do we do with this? Well, every believer is equipped and called by God to serve him. That's the reality. Every single one of us are a sent people. We're a sent people who are to be people of prayer, uh, praying for more people to take up the cause of Christ. We were sent people into, like as sheep among wolves, so we're sent into hostility. Jesus even went so far as to say that the world hated him, how much more will they hate us? Um, but the good news that comes along with that is that he also says that like, in this world we'll have trouble, but like take heart, he's overcome the world. So it's not that we won't have trouble, but it's that he's overcome it. And so again, that brings us to our third piece, which is that we're to be dependent on him as a people who are sent. So we are called by God to serve. And this passage reveals some important principles within ministry. Like he sends them out two by two, right? So ministry takes teamwork. We're never called to go it alone. As a matter of fact, anytime you see somebody doing ministry who begins to isolate themselves, we often see that they end up um, falling into some kind of moral failure, uh, whatever that moral failure may look like. Successful ministry begins with prayer. And so we need to be a people of prayer. And before we do whatever it is that we're going to do, we need to bathe it in prayer. Now, the work can be dangerous, and it can be hostile, but he's overcome it, and so we can rest in him. A successful ministry needs to keep its focus. Like We need to remind ourselves that it's not about us, it's about him, and that we need to be focused on him and, and what he's called us into. Successful ministry is faithful to the gospel and Jesus' teachings. In other words, we are going to be people of the word. We're going to be people of the Bible. We're going to allow the Bible to inform how we function in compassion and empathy with other people. We're going to allow the Bible to tell us and how we are to view the world around us. So we need to have a biblical worldview. This is what we're called into, and we're going to hold true to the gospel and the teachings of Jesus unapologetically. And we will not allow wolves to alter how we understand Scripture. But we're also in that to be humble even when the ministry is successful. Remember, they came back and they said, look, even the demons obey us. Great. That's awesome. Don't let that be your focus. Let the fact that you're saved be your focus. So we're to be humble in the ministry. We're to be happy about successful ministry, but rejoice even more over our salvation. And we rejoice over being able to see God's hand at work and his grace granted to us. This is what we walk away with. And in doing so, we start to fulfill this thing that Jesus says he came to give us, which is life to the fullest, which has purpose. Look, if you're looking for purpose in your Christian walk, maybe look at what's not happening in your life. Dive into doing life the way Jesus calls you to do it. Recognize that you are a sent person. You're sent. 
And you're sent with purpose and you're sent with giftings and you're sent with the one who says he'll back you and you gotta rely on him and you're gonna be dependent on him. And yeah, you're sent into places that are uncomfortable and sometimes even hostile to you, but you're sent. You're sent. And in being sent, man, the Christian walk is never boring. It's always exciting. And there's so many more people that need to hear the loving, saving grace of Jesus. He sends you. He sends me. Let's pray. Lord God, I thank you so much for today, and I thank you for your word. I thank you for the depth that is here and so many different things that we could be unpacking. And so, Lord God, I thank you that your word is alive and, and that it, it just motivates, instructs, and encourages us. And I pray, Lord, that as people of your word, that we would recognize that we are a sent people and that we would step in to whatever it is you've called us into. We step in with prayer. We step in with focus. We step in with team, like with others. And, and we recognize, Lord, that we're not called in this life to do it alone. We're called to do it in the context of community. We're called to be people of your word. And we're called to be people of your message. And so, Lord God, may we rejoice over the fact that you grant us salvation and that we get to offer that to others. In your name I pray, Lord. Amen.